figure out what actually happened. Um, everybody says, when I first got into the car accident business, I was doing auto claims. Everybody said, I stopped at the stop sign. Or I came to a complete stop at the corner. Well, you know that can't be true, because if you did, you guys would have never met in the intersection. So you really have to figure out, well, what actually happened? And I never forget one case. This woman swore up and down to me. I stopped. And I went to the intersection. And, well, if she was speeding, she would have jammed on the brakes and it would be skid marks. And if the other guy actually stopped, there should be skid marks. If they're speeding at any rate, there should be skid marks. There were no skid marks. And so I walked back and forth. And I finally said to the woman, I said, let me ask you a question. Did your foot ever slip off the brake and hit the gas? I'm not asking about this specific time. But does that ever happen? She said, yes. So what really happened was she put her foot on the gas, I mean, on the brake. It slipped off, hit the gas pedal, and that's what happened. So what? I guess I'm part detective, because you had to figure out the answer, you know, and well, who's right and who's wrong, there is no, well, who's, who am I going to pay in this case, so that, that's what it was, but, um, yeah, I'm just having fun here, so this is the first time I'm ever doing this, so, excuse me, <laughs> your first book, yes, yes, so, it's, thank you very much, I, I've gotten a lot of responses, and everybody loves it. So, you know, when you start anything, uh, either in business or painting or whatever, you have no idea what's going to happen. You just know you put all of your words down on a page, and you're hoping the rest of the world likes it. And mass sequins love it. And that really is very heartwarming to me, because I spent six months of my life writing it, uh, two years trying to get it published. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of toil in that, and it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, someone had asked me once, "What was the proudest moment of writing this book?" And I'll be honest, it was the day the book, the publisher, sent the book to my house in bound form, and I took it out of the, of the, of the box. And my wife said, "You know, what's in the box?" So I took it out of the box and I showed it. It was the book. And my wife said, oh, my husband, the author. <laughs> and I go, okay, that was it. All right, you know, I made it. My, my wife thinks I'm an author now. So, you know, that was really good. And, and she, I, I mean, I owe her a lot. I mean, it, it, you guys are married. You, you really know your partner really does a lot. She it, it does a lot. So wives do a lot and husbands do a lot. She read this about 50 times uh, because... It, it's you, how's it coming and so you're looking to her but you know having your spouse do it is really not the perfect thing because how many spouses is going to take this stinks <laughs> so i wasn't sure if it was good at all um because i can see my wife who says oh yeah she was like well your grandma stinks well <laughs> that's why we have you know word to fix that um, but everything else was, was pretty good. So it was very interesting in, in doing it that way. But um, you probably want to know what actually started all this. I'm in Burns Park, and I was working out there. Every, every morning I was running through Burns Park. And one morning, a black Range, Range Rover pulls up. And this woman gets out. Now, if you ever ran at Burns Park, you know no one dresses for Burns Park. No, we're wearing ratty old jeans and sweats. We're not, we're not dressing to go out. This woman gets out of the car. She was dressed to the nines. She had an outfit on that, you know, she's going to the gym to go pick up guys in. So I, I thought to myself, that was odd, but, you know, this is New York. She bent over, picked up four pebbles, and put them on a bench. Now, the bench was near with a sock. You know the, uh, where they have the lawn, where they have this, the, uh, the, the music? And by the challenge field, the bench is right there. So she pulls up, gets out, picks up four pedals, put them on the bench. Now I'm thinking to myself, this is, this is out of the ordinary, but I'm too busy. Two days later, 
another car comes in, pulls into the same spot. A woman gets out dressed in the same manner, dressed to the nines. In other words, she's still not here. She bends over, picks up four pebbles, and puts them on the same bench. And then they both, when the, when the first woman did it, she disappeared. The second woman did it, she disappeared. Because I expected to see them jog. They had jogging outfits on. None of their jog. I couldn't find out where they were going. And every time I passed the bench, the pebbles moved. So I asked a friend of mine who's a retired cop. I said, what's going on here? After he stopped laughing, he said, Gary, you just witnessed a drug drop. And he had worked in, in Burn Clark. And he was telling me there's a lot of things that go on there are, are kind of suspect. But they never really had the time or the manpower to figure it out. So that was the genesis for the whole thing. And uh, there is the, in the book, there's a woman with the, the hat on and says, the end? She was a real woman. And she, <laughs> she gets out of her car every morning and walks around. But the first five minutes, she gets out, walks across the soccer field, and she disappears. And it wasn't until one day when I was jogging on the soccer field where I tripped where I saw the porta potties. And the porta potties is like, oh, okay, so something must be going on at the porta potties where everybody's disappearing to. So that, that's how really a lot of the, the story came about. And then the, the rest of the story is just fiction. But uh, it, it, was, it's, uh, it was fun in writing it because um, I would just sit down. And the way I did it is um, Thursday afternoon, Friday, all day Saturday, uh, I just went down my, my computer and just kept on typing away. I put my earbuds in, I block out the world, and I just kept on writing away at it. And uh, as I came to different scenarios, just things said, okay, this is what we, where we could go with it, and I just put it down on paper. And uh, when I came back, because like most of us, we all have to go to work and earn a living, uh, like Wednesday night, I would start to read where I left off, so Thursday, when I started writing, I knew where I was, and I, I keep going. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, when you first started reading, writing the book, did you plan on mentioning so many things, or did they come into your mind as you were writing the book? As I was writing the book, I wanted to have places to have something uh, occur. And um, like the, the Mass Pico Diner, I just felt that was a great place because they had the windows looking out at Sunrise Highway. Um, so Pilgrim State, was I, I knew about there because I had uh, driven through it. So I knew where the properties and it. it just came from. I knew where the properties were. I knew where the locations were. So I just felt that that was a good location for something to happen. So it, so I guess the short answer is it popped into my mind as I was writing it, looking for a location. So, yeah. I want to follow up on that. You are always starting a book and having it too familiar to today, you know, made me a little uneasy, I'd say. Also, I wanted you to keep reading, but too familiar. <laughs> are there still pebbles on the benches? <laughs> No, no, no. no, no. no. Uh, did they get rid of that situation? Yes, they did. <laughs> they did. Um, um, I don't know what they did. I don't want to know what they did. Um, but yeah, they're, they're gone. Yes, ma'am. As I started to read it, I used to walk in Burns Park every morning and afternoon. And I was going to the high school. So, like, you know, these, me and my friend, too, you know, Normal people, we were walking around in, in pitch black. I'm saying, you know what? There was a lot of stuff probably going on as we were just talking about that I was walking around. Yeah, well, it, interesting. Yeah, yeah it just, uh, if, if you, you ever sit back and just kind of, you know, disappear mm -hmm. and, and watch the world unfold in front of you, there's a lot that goes on 
that we're all lives are really busy. We have to drop the kids off, or I want to do my three laps and get home because I got to go to work. Um, we're attending to our lives. We're not really watching the world, and that's where um, I had time. And when I saw this, uh, I continued to uh, run around the run around the park and um, find more characters for the book. Now that I look back, there were a lot of characters in the five years that I walked there at 5.30. <laughs> 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 what made it interesting is I didn't know any about MS-13. I didn't know about the Chinese cartel. Yeah. yeah. And that information that you've gotten into the book was very interesting. Yeah. Yes. And um, well, did you do research on that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I did a lot of research on, on drugs and where our drugs were coming from, because a lot of our drugs, as we all know now, are being made in China. Um, and I think a lot of that should be brought home for a lot of reasons, let alone just the simple supply. Um, and you can't, uh, you can't, it, what they're putting into it and things like that, uh, I have no idea. But they're very much involved in this, and their whole government is set up. The MSS is a real part of the Chinese government, and they are here. That's the first time I ever heard of that. Yeah. It, it is a problem. And they are sending people. Um, the Germans uh, and the Russians, rather, the Russians sent couples over here in the 50s. Uh, so a lot of the people are, a lot of the countries are modeling things that other countries did that had success. So the Chinese saw that and um, I think they're, they're duplicating. And I, I know that for a fact because there have been a lot of espionage cases made. There were Chinese citizens who came to America working for corporations or universities and feeding all of that intelligence stuff, all of that IT stuff back to China. So it's not, uh, it's not a big stretch that they were involved with this. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you actually know any um, police officers yes. from the Massey people that yes. you based the book on? Uh, well, I, there, was, there was one officer who uh, helped me. Um, I needed to understand how MS-13 would react in certain, certain situations. Uh, and during his career, he did a lot of drug work. And he told me what would happen. If so if someone in the in MS-13 broke a rule, they would pay for it with their life. However, if a civilian like Marianne steals the money, okay. Marianne, they want to they want to punish Marianne, but they don't want to kill her because it just brings too much heat. And what is this all about? Uh, they'll fix the guy's wagon who lost the money, but the person who stole it, they'll beat, they'll beat them up. They won't necessarily kill them. So that, that's, I did do a lot of research about them, about MS-13 and how they were react, reacting, so I could really portray what would actually happen. Yes, sir. I'm curious, as a new author, um, how long or how many uh, publishers did you have to send your book to or manuscript to? Uh, I was curious about the process. You know, you, very often you see it on TV where, you know, someone, I mean, how realistic is it? What was your um, uh, findings? Uh, how did it work out for you? What, what was the steps that you took? And what roadblocks did you have or failures? I got to kick back to you. The way the, the roadway is you get an agent and then you get a publisher. You can submit the, the script, uh, the manuscript to the publisher directly. Um, well, it took me six months to write it and two years to get it published. <laughs> so so that, that was, I have many um, letters saying we're not interested, this is not our type of book. Um, a friend of mine knows a publisher, told him what the book was about, and they had said, okay, send this to manuscript. And then I got a letter from them saying that this is in our, 
genre. genre. So you know, we don't want to touch it. Um, but but we'll, like life itself, there's a lot of no's. You just you have to keep on knocking to get a yes. Did you yeah. negotiate how many books? Like I see a part of the books. Like, do they say, well, since you're a new author, you have no following, we're only going to produce 10,000 books? Or, you know, uh, is there, in other words, they limit it so. In, 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 yeah, they, they limit the, the first printing, uh, they limit it. Uh, if you want more, you can get more printed, but they'll limit the first printing because. Uh, as my last name is in Tom Clancy, so you know, then that, you know. Uh, but funny, Tom Clancy was in the insurance business, and I'm going to tell you a funny story about this, and you'll appreciate it because Tom Clancy was a property and casualty agent, you know, so he sold homeowners or you know, automobiles, business insurance, things like that. His office is in Annap is near Annapolis, so now think about the book he wrote. Right? It's, it's all a Navy book. And who are his clients? Annapolis graduates. People who work for the Navy. The Hunt for Red October is a real book. It's a real thing that happened. Not in the Atlantic Ocean, but in the Pacific Ocean. And I think that his clients told him stories. Like, you know, you're just sitting across the store table and think, how are things going? What's going on in your life? And they told him the story. He wrote the book, changed where it happened. And when he tried to get the book published, the Department of Defense squashed it. They didn't want to have it published. And then Reagan said it was a good, interesting book. And then 50,000 copies flew off the shelf. And the publisher he got uh, gave him five thousand dollars for the manuscript, and it was a very small publisher, and the agent was from an, the Annapolis area. And that's the only reason why he got it. But I think he got it published because uh, they only gave him five thousand dollars. But obviously, since then he's been very successful. It kind of worked out for him. Yeah, it kind of worked out for him. Yeah. So, but uh, they. The manuscript business, the book business, has changed a lot. Um, you don't have to wait for uh, a publisher to find a publisher to do it. There are a lot of publishers out there um, that will look at your book and assess it and take a risk on it. Um, this, that side of it, they'll take a risk on it to publish the book. If you go to Time Warner or some of the big publishers, they read the book, they assess it, and whether they, th they think they can make a lot of money on it, that's when they put the full, full uh, checkbook behind it. It's the publishing, it's the advertisements, it's the, like in Newsday, you see they have book, the author, so that's all big publishers that have put that together. So they're behind that. So that's, that's the push that they get from there. So, but um, I thought it was a good story. I had fun writing it. And uh, I got paid publishing they only take 25% of their of people that submit manuscripts, they take. And mine was one of them. So I, I was, I could not believe the letter. When I got the letter, <laughs> it's like getting into college, you know? You've been accepted. Yes. This would make a very good action movie. Has anybody come to you? I, I, someone called me from Hollywood, and I was I almost fell off my chair when I got the phone call. And he said to me, he goes, we read your book, we like it, you have to pay us five grand to do a reel. So I didn't really understand all of this, but now I kind of some understand it a little more. In Hollywood, they have uh, a conference where you go to pitch your book become a movie. And they're not reading the book because they're looking at thousands of pitches. So they go by reels. So it's a, a two to three minute reel about the book. That's what takes $5,000 to get it there. All right. So um, I do think it's, it's, it's a, I like the action because when I started to write it, I didn't want to have uh, like War and Peace, I'm going to give you 50 pages on each character. No, 
I'm the type of guy, listen, I want to read it, I want to have enjoyment, have fun, and then get on with the next book or the next thing I have to do. So it was a lot of fun in that sense. That was So I, I, I do still get a lot of calls about that. I'm just cautious because I don't, if you said to me, okay, give me $3,500 and to do the real, because they're not doing it for free. I, I understand that. I want, I, want, I want to find out the way to know if their connections are legitimate. Right. So, you know, uh, many people says, oh, I can do this for you. Okay. And it doesn't pan out. So what did I get? So that's what I'm, tr that's what I'm trying to figure out. The security house, that kind of interest me. The jungle, that interest me. And Idaho. So you got three places. Oh, oh yes. And... Uh, you got Easter, Easter Island. Island. What did you guys think about Easter Island? I like it. Yeah. And that naval base is there. No, it's there. Yeah. And because I went to Chile uh, to climb a mountain and go whitewater rafting. And um, some people had uh, come from there. And they were telling me about all the things that they saw. And I needed a place to put Warren. I just couldn't. I needed a secure place I could put him in, and that I found it, and that, that's why I put him there. So, just because you mentioned why Idaho, why Idaho? Um, I looked up um, a place. Where was where would you want to go if you want to disappear? So, I thought to myself, preppers. Do you guys know what preppers are? Okay. Preppers are basically people who think the world is going to come to an end. Civilization is going to come to an end. So they're looking for places to get, get, out, get off the grid, live on their own, things like that. So I thought Warren, once he gets out of the business of the drugs, he does not want to be followed by the cartel. So I thought if preppers were off the grid, you could never find them. So I looked for best place for preppers to go. And um, they said Texas, Tennessee, South Carolina, Idaho. And I then started looking up comments about every state. Texas, a lot of the preppers, basically, well, people writing back, I assume, were preppers. Texas is not the right place. Now, remember, this is about three or four years ago. Texas is not the right place to go. Obviously, they knew more than anybody else knew. Because they're getting overrun by illegals. So there's no nothing there. You can't do that. You can't live off the grid. Tennessee, they told me that their comments was, well, there's the TVA there, the dam, and there's a nuclear power plant there. So if that ever blew, why would you go there? And Idaho, I was in Idaho. I went whitewater rafting there. It's a very nice place, very beautiful, and it's kind of like there's not many people there. So it was a nice place to go. And they had a lot of places about uh, that said, if you want to live off the grid, Idaho was the best place to be. If, you know, so that was, that was why, because that's why I picked it. And the house was an actual house, because I started looking for real estate. And the house that was for sale is, was an actual house with an airfield. It, it was selling for $900,000. All in. All in, $900,000. Um, and I thought that, wow, that's... And the views from this guy's front yard were just unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's since been taken off the market. Because it, it, it was for $900,000, and there were no takers. That's what was, I couldn't believe that. Uh, but there were no take, no one was bidding on it. Um, and the, the, I'll tell you a secret, they, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> there are no, the mining tunnels were not in Idaho. The mining tunnels I found in a property in Tennessee. Because I was actually looking for houses so I then could describe them. Tennessee, this house in Tennessee, had three caves. And they were actually gorgeous. gorgeous. The house, I, I didn't like at all. And I just think the, the way it was situated wasn't nice. Uh, so 
I, I just stole the, the caves from there and moved them to Idaho. Um, so that's a little license I get when I can do that. Um, yes. James. Yes. The security guy, I forget the ops of something. Is he such a person or is there, like you say, you wrote about real people. But is there really a security system that does all the security in that fashion? Um, I've been told by a tech person that who read the book, you're 10 years ahead of us. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And, but it, there's a, there's a, they're working on systems like this. So, I, I was, there was one woman who read the book, and I asked her, how, what did she like about the book? And she says, I want Melvin. <laughs> She says, she said to me, can't you get me Melvin? I go, no, I can't get you Melvin. She goes, no, no, I know you can get Melvin. Come on, tell me where I can get Melvin. I go, Melvin's not here yet. Uh, and that's when I had asked an IT guy, how far away from this? He says, 10 years. Because the house in Nazapipo is all secured. Oh, all very secure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think in, in not too distant future, people are going to want that. Especially is if there, we have, is there a house in Massapequa like that? There was, there was, a, there was a house in Massapequa that, that um, the design of it, that, that there's a house in Massapequa just like I described it. It doesn't have the security yet. But I think shortly that people will want it. Especially if you live on the water, you're going to want those shades so nothing can get in. All right. So I think, and they're going to want the security of knowing what's going on. Uh, but that's, uh, that was just, you know, part of it. Yes, sir. Well, I guess, uh, well, you said we're uh, ten, uh, probably 10 years off from, the, from Melbourne, but I guess I could see, we have Alexa. I mean, this is Alexa taken like to the nth degree. I guess it could be done. Oh, yeah, it's just, it, I think it, uh, when the IT guy said to me, he said, it's, it's not the individual parts but actually to have the artificial intelligence and all the systems to merge and act together and have one system that, you know, we as not non-techies could say to Melvin, this is what I want done, and do it, that's what they're away for. It's just a language to make them all coordinate together and have one person to do it, uh, or one person to talk to. And, and it's your voice, they're going to know your voice, which... Most people don't. You call Verizon and they say, okay, Verizon is my carrier, whatever it is. The, so they have your voice print, so they know it's you. So we're not, I don't think we're that far away. So. Yes, sir. Um, is the, um, uh, I forget the name, I think it's Porto uh, Aventura, that, that community. Is there anything yes. in that area that exists like that? Uh, the, the, that the house is real. Casa... Uh, she's, the house is real. It's actually very beautiful. It is. It does have security around it. The type of security that I designed was uh, described was not there. It's not yet there yet. That's something that Stephen in the book designed specifically for that, and for the other, uh, you know, other uh, diplomatic headquarters and things like that. But that's that again is not that far away. And that's the the IT person also said that to me. He says that's not that far away either. Because you know, the ambassadors, they're civilians. They're not techies. They're there. They have no idea how to protect themselves, especially when they're on foreign land. So they want systems like that. So can it happen? Yes. But that property, Casa, in, in Mexico is a real house. It's got a beautiful pool. Um, a lot of re writing a book, you do a lot of research. Um, so I would have my computer in front of me and my iPad over here and my other computer over here, and I'm researching properties in Mexico that I can go to. And uh, that house is on the tip of Mexico. It's a beautiful pool. And all of the animals are there. So it was, uh, and that, that house does have caves, on, caves in it. So uh, that was not literary license, it was actual. Do any of you want to become writers? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a 
you tell me about the general and the relationship with Warren and Stephen? Ah, uh, the general. He he is basically that. You mean the the, the the admiral? You mean the John, general uh, Gregory? Gregory? Um, John. Uh, right. There, it's their uncle. Uncle. It's their uncle. Right. Um, well, just because he knew they were druggies, right? Yeah. Where did that come from in the story? Warren, Warren is actually a wound, a wounded vet. He's actually a. Uh, he was in the war, he got wounded, all of his men came home uh, in one piece, and so they idolized Warren because he got them through it. Um, so when he gets hit, he gets hit in the, hit in the shoulder in war, uh, he's got tremendous pain. And what happens is uh, he uh, was getting drugs that upset the pain, and it just didn't work anymore. And that's when he turned to real drugs, street drugs, and he just got entangled in something and lost his life. But the, the general had his own life. He was high up in the military, really couldn't do anything about it, but he always kept an eye on him. So, you know, it's like they know, uh, it's like any other, ch if you have a, a child or a friend who has a child who's involved with drugs or alcohol or something like that, you know, sometimes they've got to hit rock bottom for you to help them. And uh, the general kept involved in them, but he, he knew what they were involved in. It wasn't hurting his, it wasn't hurting his position, or, so he didn't really come down on it. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, you know, you described a fair amount of uh, uh, you know, Warren's personal history, but uh, it wasn't very much about Stephen other than, you know, he was helping his brother in, in all these enterprises. And I wondered if you uh, thought about flushing him out a little bit more, if you had a love interest at some point, or, or anything more about his, uh, his history? Yes, in my second, and I, I started a second book, it's called The Senator. Stephen is, Stephen is going to be played up more in that book, and He's going to get flushed out, and he's yes, he will have a love interest. Yes, ma'am. That was my question. Did you are you planning on having a sequel? Yes, uh, the book is called The Senator, and it's about a New York State U.S. Senator who retires, and he retires to Idaho, buys a ranch right next to them, and that's how he gets to meet them. The, the senator is kind of like a. a is an old-time senator where he really want to, wants to get the best done for his constituents and doesn't, doesn't really care about the rest of the world. This is what my people want, and I'm not backing down. So he's not going to say yes to a lot of crazy things. So he's like a peacemaker because he wants to get things done, and he's retiring. And uh, um, he is held in high esteem because he's really tried to get a lot of things done the old-fashioned way uh, in politics, which was they kind of traded back and forth. Well, I need this from my people, you need that, or people need this, and that's why he's held in high esteem. But he retires and goes to Idaho, and that's where he meet up, and that's when the fun begins. And then yes, Warren, uh, Stephen will have a love, a love interest. Yes, ma'am. I like the character Mary Ann. Yeah. She seems very smart because she was able to get MS-13 and the MSS to fight themselves. She didn't seem like she had a drug problem. No. But why was she in special agent? Wasn't she? A, yes. What happened to her that they just took her right out of the computer systems? When there's special ops involved, yeah. these things are top secret, and they're top secret for many years. Because the things that happen top secret, they don't want anybody to know. So they wouldn't give her any kind of insurance? Because when, when, the, when the military uh, purged her records, she's no longer in the system. So she's gone. That's why they couldn't get the records. And, and unfortunately, that's not ha that's not just a book problem. That actually happened. 
records were purged in the Pentagon, these guys can't get any benefits, yet they served. But they can't prove they served. Yeah, excuse me? It is a shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's, when I said that, and when Mary is saying, listen, I served my country, I did everything right, and here I am, here. How did this happen? Um, Marianne, for me, is, is an all of, she's really American in a sense that she's the person, because as Americans, we were never born with a silver spoon. We hardly know what the spoon is. Maybe the wooden spoon, but that's about it. We're getting hit with it. But we we'll all try to find, we're, we're presented with a problem, and we're trying to find a solution. Either we're going to go around it, we have to go through that door. How do we go through that door? Sometimes we're going to climb through the window. That's how we get in. But I felt she was really an American in the sense that she emphasized everything we can do. We're going to find we're going to find a solution to this, and that's why it was a lot of fun writing for her. I got to tell you, yeah, uh, you guys may not appreciate this, but women writing for a woman as a woman. That's a little daunting as a man. And um, like I had three editors for the book. And uh, one, the last editor who uh, I showed the book to, she says to me, you're a guy. How did you write this, this Marianne character? I said, it was really tough. It was especially tough putting on that painting of us. And she was left. She goes, I go, yeah. How do you guys go put this stuff on and go around with this? It's really ridiculous. So she was left. But, you know, you really have to get into her mindset and, and what she would do. And it was a lot of fun uh, being Marianne. So, um, I'll call the question to Marianne. When in your writing did you um, decide to make Warren in love with Marianne? Did you know that when you just started writing? Was it later on? A friend of mine, uh, when I had told him I started to write, he had told me, Gary, the most important thing you have to remember is where you want to end the book. And I knew right then and there when he said it to me, I wanted Warren and Mary Ann to do it. So that was really, it was really early on. That's why um, he, there are a lot of things that he does that, that as a a drug guy, he wouldn't have done, but he really likes her from the moment he sees her. There was something about her that he didn't really like. She broke the guy's neck. Right, right, right. And, and she moved all, all of the people, because what he really is amazed about is that how she moved, remember there were people in the park? She moved them all to the house. She hated the park. She never wanted anything to do with the park because it was too open for her. So she made them all home deliveries. And he loved that. And that's why he rewards her by giving, making her a partner. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say that I know I like the ending, it was a happy ending. But it kind of seemed like that, um, you know, they say the crime is not justified. It seems like crime is justified. She lived a better life for the crime. Yes, in, 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 she, she, in the end, she, they were getting close to her. Um, there were a lot of people coming in. You had the, the FBI, not the FBI, the federal government coming in with NCIS coming in after her, trying to get information. You had the Chinese Secret Service coming after her, and then you had MS-13 coming after her. So they were all coming after her, and if she didn't figure out a way to solve her problem, she would have been one of the casualties too. So she would have paid for it. But I just felt at that point that Marianne deserved a better life because she really got a raw deal. And that's how I just I'd like to see Warren get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, what made you make uh, Warren a painter, you know? Uh, is it because he was wounded in the service, or, and that's what he did after? You know, I was just wondering how he became a, a real good painter, <laughs> making lots of money. <laughs> yeah. Lots of money, yeah. But that, the, the art was somewhat of, a, of an accident. The, the auction was an accident, how he made his first $60 million in art. Um, 
I think everybody has a way of dealing with life. Some walk, some take up music, some, you know, go to the gym, good boxing. Um, and at the time, a friend of mine had picked up painting. And I could never see him picking up painting. And he said to me, my therapist told me to do it. And I said to him, how's it working? He says, I throw paint at a canvas. I said, how do you feel? After I throw the paint, great. But then I got to clean up. Right? So I thought that was really, you know, other things that were happening. I said, okay, let me put this in here. Uh, um, along the, the same line, is your financial background and uh, why you decided to launder the money through the world? Is that, is that a common practice? Or? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I was trying to figure out, I have all this money and I want to make it legal. So how do you do that? And you guys remember a silver rabbit that sold for like $50 million? It's about this big. Okay. One day, in the, while I was writing the book, and I was trying to figure out how to do this, they sold a silver rabbit for $50 million. I thought, that rabbit is not worth $50 million. And when I hear what these paintings are going for, I go, you guys are crazy. But I remember someone telling me, um, in my career as an insurance agent, uh, I had an office in New York City on the eighth floor, and what was uh, the office next to me was a travel agent. And I always thought to myself, "What are you doing on the eighth floor as a travel agent?" And his business was laundering money. And I go, "How can you launder money?" And this was the days where you could just get on a plane. The TSA was not around. In South America, you can only take out a couple of thousand dollars and leave the country. They bought, one guy would buy the entire first class, and that's how they got the money out. So it's, it's easy when you start thinking of what they did. Yeah, when he cashed the, the ticket in here, he got like 60% of his money back. What did he care? He could never got the money out of the country anyway. So, so, but when I saw the rabbit, and I remember what this guy was doing, I go like, okay, this is an easy way to do it. Uh, I can take one of his paintings, he walks it off. It's clean money now. He paid his taxes. They ask him, the IRS asks him, how did you make the money? The check is from the art dealer, goes to the feds. Everyone's happy. Why are they going to ask questions? I sold the painting. That's how I made my money. I do think, I do think. Some of that's happening, and I think Bitcoin, a lot of that's happening. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess uh, along those lines, um, with uh, you know taking well the, the art or suppose the art, and uh, more importantly the money, um, you know having hop, hopscotch air uh, flying into Mexico. So there's, it's really that easy to do without having to go through customs or. Not being detected. Well, I, I, there was literally a license because if, if when you leave Republic Airport or any airport, you have to file a flight plan. So I never filed it. In the book, I don't file a flight plan. So you're pretty much not, they're not going to, they don't know anything about it. But you would have to file a flight plan to go to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Some of the cartels don't. In the, in the, you know, Coast Guard and other people are watching out for those planes that don't file flight plans. Because if you see a plane, from what I understand, if you see a plane, you know the number because it's on the scope. Where's, where are they going to? There's a flight plan that's filed so they know where you're going. So that's just literary license. One detailed mistake. Yeah. So laundering through uh, through art that's um, um, that, that's a that's a common way uh, for money, much money laundering to occur. And tax evasion. Yeah. Well, the smart people probably don't evade the taxes. 
because you really don't want Uncle Sam looking for you at the same time, because it, it's easier as, well, no, I sold the painting or I bought a painting and I paid X number of dollars for it. You know, if you're tr just trying to, you don't pay the taxes, then Uncle Sam is really going to want to know why. Where did you get the money to pay this? You know, things like that. So, yes, ma'am. I was just going to ask you, in your sequel, is that going to take place in Massachusetts? I feel like that was pretty uh, exciting to see all the places we know in Massachusetts. So is that going to take place in Massachusetts? Yeah, yes. Um, they, they, the senator um, gets a tip from a priest on Long Island that something is occurring here, and he comes back. To Long Island, and uh, it's it's going to happen here because most of the people I talk to, uh, they love the fact that it's here, and they know the places, and so they really love it. And uh, I was talking to another author, and the author said, uh, if you have it at the same place, you're going to get more readers that way because. She was telling me about another author who wrote an entire series of books in a town, I think it's in New Hampshire, and everything keeps on happening there. Um, so I, I, I'm going to bring it back here. Um, but I wanted to go to Idaho so they meet up with each, both with each other. So that's the connection. And then I'm going to bring them back here. And I'm going to bring all of them back here. Okay. So I'll have to figure out how, how Warren gets killed or what have you or gets arrested. Anything at the Peninsula Golf Course? <laughs> I live right there. <laughs> no, no, I, I haven't. But you, when you sit down and you write and, and you get to points in the. In the things just stop popping as to what you need to get to the next juncture. And you never know. I mean, at the, at when Warren gets shot um, in Mexico, you know, going to Easter Island, it just, oh, that, that's a perfect place to go. And I, I Googled Easter Island, and I found out the Navy base, and uh, well, it's a NASA base. Uh, and I said, okay, fine, I'll send them right there. So... As you're writing, the things come up, and it somehow just fits, and you just put it in. So, yes. You also did good advertising for Guerrero's Pizza. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Are they friends of yours? No, we just I just order pizza there a lot, and I, I like the I like the the, the pie. So uh, you know. So, Trust, I mean, yes. That's true to yes. 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 So, we'll have to try it. yeah. so <laughs> it's a, a follow up to that. Do you have to secure their um, uh, okay to use the name? Because sometimes when you see a disclosure at the end of a TV show, none of these characters are based on anybody but you know that really exists. So, uh, if I'm going to use Carmelo's Pizza or the other pizzeria. Do you have to go to, to those people and say, is, uh, do I have your permission to use your name in the book? Um, I didn't. And it's gone through uh, editing and legal review, and no one said anything. The only pushback, Black Ops, there's a company called, it's Black, it's Black, um, Black Operations Real Estate Company. Um, they... The legal people said you have to change the name, so I just said Black Ops. But there was a Black Operational Real Estate, something like that. So they, they told me to change that name. But all the other names are, uh, I didn't have to do anything about it. I actually went to the Nautilus and told them we were in the book. Um, <laughs> no, they said, uh, you want to have a free talk here? And I said, oh, okay, yeah, it would be, be good. Um, uh, but it was in the midst of COVID, so I didn't think it yeah. was going to come out. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I may have just said, um, did you at some point, you said you did run in Burns Park. Do you actually live in Massapequa? You have lived in Massapequa? I, I live in Massapequa. I live in Nassau Shores. You still do live in Massapequa? Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, um, the third generation. Um, my son and his wife just had a granddaughter, so it's like, wow. 
We've been here for three generations or all here in this people. So it's, it's nice. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was trying to envision where uh, the two houses were in, in Massapequa, and okay, I kept uh, driving through the neighborhood, and I, my, my assumption was uh, that the safe house was uh, off East Shore Drive, kind of like behind Park Physical Therapy, mm -hmm. and, uh, and oh, so that's that's where you envisioned it as well. And then the uh, Lawrence house, uh, I was thinking it was not on East Shore, because I thought it might have described Bayfront Park, but maybe it's one of those other you know, adjacent streets like the, uh, you know, the houses that front on the bay. Yes, yeah, so the, the Warren's house is uh, um, the actual house where I got a lot of the pictures in my mind, how I saw it. It's on like West Shore Drive down on, on the bend. Oh, West Shore. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, a lot of those houses are very nice, and, and a lot of those houses got creamed during sanding, so they all had to go through real big uh, yeah, upgrades and things like that. But it's uh, it's nice. Then, then, then a lot of them come back. Some of them still have to be raised, but a lot of them come back. Right. And it's it's very nice how they did that. Do you have a lot of Pasapequins? Uh, have they been buying the book? Yes. The yes. Uh, um, I, I get a lot of people who read it, and they're from Massapequa. They, they, they come involved with the chamber, and they they've read it, and they're all Massapequa. Yes, yeah. yeah, and um, it really it's really nice. I really you know people say they've read it, and they are from Massapequa, and they liked it because of that. Uh, it, it really is heartwarming to me. I really it give me good. I said to my daughter, who's in Texas, so she grew up in the socialist like me. And now that book is out in Texas, so she's sharing it with her. Well, she'll probably appreciate the part of the the Texas clouds. She'll appreciate that because my brother lives in Texas. Okay. And um, he lives uh, in, in uh, Westlaco, which is really way, way south. And. Um, he and I had climbed Kilimanjaro, and so we saw the clouds there. That's where I actually saw the clouds. And when we came back to Texas, he was asking me, well, what do you think about the clouds in Texas? And they have a lot of uh, features to them. They're a lot of very animated. I, I think that you can see the people and the, the people there and the, the animals. So it's very, um, so it's very nice. So, do you have any other questions, sir? <laughs> I uh, made you think of one, but. Yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, uh, yeah. So when I started doing this, after I, I actually witnessed what it was, and my friend tells me that you dummy, it's, it's a, you witness a drug drop. Um, I would go home Thursday, uh, Thursday afternoon, and I would start writing. All day Friday, I would write. All day Saturday and Sunday, I just I had to go to church and then get ready for work. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then it would just keep on going. And uh, I would put my earbuds in, block out the world, and um, I would listen to a tune you said. It was a Laurel Dingo. It's a, and basically the song was about uh, um, you said. I'm, it, it, it basically, see, you know, we, we all have those things that we hear in our heads that we're never going to amount to anything, or we're, we're not good enough, or whatever. Well, she goes the other way. She goes, you said I'm good enough. So that's what just it just starts in my ears. But when you start to write, kind of do you black that out? So you just, um, many times I'm downstairs writing. And, of course, my wife is calling me. And I don't hear her at all. The shots come up and tap me on my shoulder. And, you know, because I guess, you know, I don't even know that someone is there. And because you're really into where you are. Like when, when they're in Mexico and uh, they're walking around the property, uh, you're actually walking around the property with them. And you're describing it, the fence, how it was designed and things like that. So you're actually, your feeling as, you're, as the author, you're right there. And one of the other great things about being an author is you can have people say anything. Do anything you want. Because, because you're the author, you're telling them, you're pulling their strings, and you're telling them what to do. So, um, we were just thinking that it was, it's, it's really great because it's, you, you get out, and different people can have different personalities. Some of them, 
need to get uh, caught. Some of them, they'll fight their way through and win in the end. So. I'm sure you can't choose, but if you were going to choose, who would be your favorite character in the book? I know you can't choose, but choose. <laughs> That's like saying, who's your favorite children? <laughs> uh, Mary Ann, to me, was probably the, I guess, the most fun to write for. Warren is complicated. So there's so many parts of his personality. You know, he got into this business. He needed to make money, so when he got into the business, he knows his, if he doesn't get out soon, his life is over. Um, so he's trying to get out. Uh, and he's trying to protect Stephen. And he wants to get out of town and, and, and start a whole new life. So that's complicated. Uh, Marianne just is trying to survive. She's easier to write for. Uh, Stephen, he's looking to invent something else that, you know, the, the defense department or the diplomatic corps need. So that, that's where he's, he's simple. Uh, I, I was thinking about how to um, get Stephen, because Stephen is almost like a recluse. He doesn't really leave because his business, like all of us today, we can work from our homes, right, if you want to. And he really just designs the protection system from his home. He doesn't really need to go anywhere. So I was thinking that the general is going to have an attache, an assistant, who's female. And they're going to meet that one. So I haven't gotten to that part in the second book, but that's how I thought they were going to meet. Because otherwise, Stephen would never meet anybody. You know, he's kind of a recluse in that place. So. Any other questions? Oh. Well, I appreciate you for coming. And... Uh, if you any, if have any aspirations of writing, give me a call and I can help you out. Uh, um, Lee and I were talking about this uh, before. Um, I wrote it and I went to Renzi, R-E-E-D-Y-S. Uh, they have editors and uh, the book I was edited, I had three editors look at it. The first editor was really the one who looked at it and gave me ideas and how to change things and things like that. So the second editor, I said, I just wanted to look at it again. And uh, they had some other comments, but really uh, not many. They felt the book was pretty good as it was. And the third editor was a local journalist on Long Island. She read the book, she liked it, um, but she needed, it needed more punch to it at certain spots. And she was telling me that when you write a book, Every chapter has got to have a reason for the reader to turn the next page. And that's what she was really telling me. She says, it's a good book, it's a good story, but you're just going to have some twists in there to make the person turn the page to get to the next chapter. So um, you're not alone when you write these books. There's organizations like that that you can go to and say, okay, how is it? And I was using them as a, my barometer. As, well, they liked it. Or they would give you comments back and forth um, as to what they thought. Uh, but my last editor, who was a woman from here, um, she felt that that's the only thing it needed. Um, and uh, I, I was happy with that. And she ultimately was right because I submitted the book for uh, it was a book club. And you can submit your book and they'll rate it. And it's like anything else. It's like, <laughs> it's like applying to college or getting, applying to get a job. You really don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, you could flop. It, it, they could say, you know, it doesn't get any stars or it gets two stars. Well, um, the editor who read my book from them, they actually, 
they let me know a day beforehand, and I was almost afraid to open up the email because uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And the guy said, I'm giving you four stars. It's a great story. Yeah. And I was like, oh, God. I read it in two. I was turning the pages. I read it in two days. I didn't, what would you find out if you need the top ten? Uh, no, well, th that comes out all the time, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that the, um, you're only going to, that's where, if you go with the main publisher, or, you know, yeah, because the, there is a lot of stuff behind that, that it's, it's pushing it, it's uh, advertising it, it's getting it into like places like Newsday and going out and feel good, you know, big book signings and getting orders. So there's a lot more to that side of the business to get you to that point. Um, or if you're, you know, writing the second book and you're Tom Clancy, you got it. You know, yeah. that's, so I'm hoping that my next book is, is uh, The Hunt for Red October, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, but I have fun writing it and maybe this is my therapy, I don't know, but it's, it's fun writing it. Um, and, so it's, a, it's fun. Yes, ma'am. I did. Um, the reason I read the book is I thought the title was intriguing. When I saw it, I knew it, it was intriguing. And what's the picture of? What's the? This this is the picture of the book. Um, and Paige, this is this is the, the this is the cover of the book. And when I was telling Page Publishing, because Page Publishing, you're very much involved in every part of it. Uh, they asked me. How would you design the front cover? So I was trying to picture Burns Park, where the pep the benches were. So I drew a picture of how it should turn out, and this is what the final rendering. That's where it started. So this is the bench, and, and not reality, but this is the artist rendering, and that's supposed to be like the backdrop of. New York City. Yeah. Well, you remember when Burns Park used to be 52 acres? Yes. And it was just nothing. That's right. That's right. 52 acres. It's a hunt preserve. Yeah. We go way back to that. Yeah. It's. That is. It's a lot of. That's. There's a lot of history in Mexico. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're probably around when uh, the Jones, the uh, Marjorie Post house, that, that house was there, the old house was there. What a beautiful house. I don't know if you guys remember. It was a beautiful house. It was a Victorian mansion. And the guy who owned it, the, ha the trees there are not, nat are not natural there. He brought them in. He was like a horticulturist. He loved botanists. I think it was. He brought those trees in. He used to travel the world and bring the trees back. And um, the way I understand it is that Mass Pico school system needed to build Burnham. And they went to the widow and said, we need to condemn your property because we need to build a school. They were going to condemn her property through eminent domain. And she said that well, I have no place to live. <laughs> Where am I going to live from? Live. And, uh, you, know, well, you know, but we need the land to build Burnham. And so she said, oh, I have another piece of property on Common Road. I'll give you that if you leave me alone. And that's, that's how Burnham was built there. All right. So. Yeah, that was my high school. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, one, one thing about uh, how the books were structured, uh, you know, when, I, when I read certain books, I, you know, I think I need, it's, it's something I need to learn about or whatever, but uh, some, some, or something that, that interests me, but uh, uh, when the chapters are like, you know, consistently 30 pages, 35 pages, I find that a little tough going through, so what I did appreciate was the, uh, you know, the relatively short chapters, you know, we get a scenario, maybe it's over in 10 pages, so, I mean, to me, that, that, that's something, I guess, that, you know, I, I was happy with, and I wonder, is, is there a, um, uh, a body of consensus whether people like short chapters, is that an advantage? Um, the first editor, uh, she gave me counts. She, she was advising me on that. 
and she said, you know, try to keep them concise and get your point across and then get to the new one. Um, and if it wasn't a chapter, like you're going to move through the chapter, then put something so you put a divide there so it doesn't get to be a huge chapter. Page Publishing really wanted it nailed down. They wanted short chapters. So the publishing house wanted short chapters. And if it wasn't, it was going to be a long chapter, they wanted me to put symbols to break points. Um, and I felt that was, I, I agree with you, I felt the same way, because I, I didn't want someone, because sometimes you see the 30 pages, and a chapter is a big point where, you, okay, if I'm going to start a new chapter, something else is going on. So I really wanted to make it concise so I could get to that, and then start a new chapter. So the first editor and the publisher wanted short chapters. Yeah, and that's like James Patterson. His chapters are very short, and that's why I could read them all in a flash. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Well, you know, I, I we just like to thank you for coming down and giving the talk. I mean, we all, I, I we all really appreciate it. Uh, listen, I appreciate it. You made my day to, to see you all here and to talk that you read the book and you appreciated it. Your questions, thank you very much. I appreciate every, every one of them, especially the comment about Warren. Uh, so I have to be thinking about that when I write the second book, how Warren is going to get... Well, he's got to get punched somehow. He's, how we got to get punched. <laughs> There's a lot of lives. <laughs> I will. All right. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks again.